the service. We acknowledge with deep gratitude that we are on the territory of the Shuswap and Tanaha nations and the chosen homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Our invocation song is, In You There Is a Refuge. In you there is a refuge, in you we find our peace. When all we know is chaos, may our trust in you increase. In you there is a silence, in you our minds are clear. When all we hear is discord, may your quiet draw us near. In you there is a vision, in you we learn to dream. When all we see is desert, may you be our living stream. In you there is a future, in you we find our way. When hope has shed its brightness, may you show us a new day. So invite us to have a moment of coming into the present moment with our, with our attention, with our, our sight and our sound and our feeling, just to step out of our minds, step out of our thoughts and come fully into the present moment. And our first hymn is Teach Me God to Wonder.
Well, our, our words of wisdom, uh, we have three of them. Uh, the first, uh, a beautiful quote from Rumi, a, a Sufi mystic. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. And then from Galib, for the raindrop, joy is entering the river. And now uh, an, another bit of wisdom. Gandhi was asked what Christians should do to properly, properly represent Jesus in India. Gandhi replied with four suggestions. I would suggest, first of all, that all of you Christians, missionaries and all, begin to live more like Jesus Christ. Second, I would suggest that you must practice your religion without adulterating or toning it down. Third, I would suggest that you must put your emphasis upon love, for love is the center and soul of Christianity. And fourth, I would suggest that you study the non-Christian religions and culture more sympathetically in order to find the good that is in them so that you might have a more sympathetic approach to the people. Our words of wisdom for today. Okay. Oh, hi. Benny, you made yeah, it back to Indonesia. Wonderful. Yeah. Nice to see you. So fun to be here. Yeah. It's different today. Yeah, yeah it I is. I like this place. <laughs> well, and that's who's great. that over there? That's Lisa. Yeah. 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 Lisa plays the piano. She's good. She is good. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, Benny. So how's and your you week? you can sing, kind of. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Kind of. I can do a lot of things, kind of. Yeah. 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 Huh. I have a question for you. Okay. I've been stressed all week. I have to, I have a decision. I'm so hungry. I just want to eat, eat, eat. Yeah. But um, I don't know if you've noticed, but when we bears go eating in a trees, yeah. sometimes we hurt the branches a little bit. And I feel really badly about that. Uh, thanks, Benny. Um, yeah, we do notice that when bears uh, eat, fruit or berries yeah. off of trees sometimes they just wreck the tree oh the other day i saw a friend he was like at the top and he just he took half the tree out yeah i know yeah. well it's interesting because i think like today we're talking about ethics have you ever heard that word before um ethic or ethics um, it's it's kind of simple ethics. benny it's about it's about um trying to make good choices yeah for oneself and for others oh and and so when we we try to make ethical choices it's about making doing what's good or healthy for ourselves and for others well that's what's it it's like it's good for me yeah and that's good like bears don't really um have to make ethical choices really i don't think so oh. it's more what humans do uh -huh. now if a bear was making ethical choices they might say Hmm. In the short term, I want the food off that tree. Yeah. In the long term, I don't want to wreck the tree because uh -huh. next year I want the tree to also give me fruit. Right. So if they just wreck a tree, then it's not going to grow fruit. Yeah. But the other one, like another sort of ethical question is what's good for the bear, but it's also what's good for the maybe the people who own the tree, like the trees on their property. Yeah. And so most bears don't think about the people who own the tree well, or own the property. Maybe it's because I know you. I start thinking about people a bit. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> are we influenced by the people we hang out by? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah. For sure. Um, today, one of the Bible stories we're reading uh, uh -huh. from, from James, it's beautiful. Uh, he says that we are to have wisdom from above or higher wisdom. Uh -huh. and, and when we live with higher wisdom, we consider what's good for everybody, and, yeah. and we also make peaceable choices. We live in peace as well as, like, we're not selfish, and we're not, we're not just thinking about ourselves. We think about the good of, of others as well, and that's like having wisdom from above or higher wisdom. You know, you, we don't have mirrors 
in the wild. And it's kind of fun to look at myself and see what I can do. Sorry, I was kind of listening to you. Yeah, well, that's pretty cute mouth you got there, Benny. Yeah. I'm glad you can play anyway, with that. I, yeah. I'm glad bears don't have to worry about ethics the same because it sounds like something that you, you should do as people. And, and yeah. I'm glad that I'll listen in today and see what you have to say. Well, just on that, Benny, it's yeah. true that the bears don't have to think, but sometimes people don't worry about yeah ethics either oh, and they should yeah because uh, you, you know we can't just sort of rampage ourselves through someone's life and property right. and, and not care about them so well, i can see that okay okay well <laughs> ciao now bye gotta go eat bye Penny. yeah take care of those trees all right i'm going back to the shared screen so i am and I'm gonna do this and Spirit, open my heart, number 79. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love me. Receiving and in giving, Spirit, open my heart. God, replace my stony heart with a heart that's kind and tender. All my coldness and fear to your grace I now surrender. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving. Spirit, open my heart. Write your love upon my heart as my love my goal, my story, in each thought, word, and deed, may my living bring you glory. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving. Spirit, open my heart. May I weep with those who weep, share the joy of sister, brother, in the welcome of Christ. May we welcome one another. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love may i love in receiving and in giving spirit open my heart and charlene's reading our scripture today good morning charlene good morning can you hear me okay yeah Okay, the first reading today is James 3, 13, 4 to 3 8, and 7, 8a. The letter of James is a type of wisdom literature. In this passage, the writer is encouraging the early Christian community to access higher wisdom in working out situations and difficulties. No doubt his instruction was necessary because people in the early Christian fellowship were hurting each other and were threatening the well-being of their community. This passage is fitting for us to read in the times we are in, as we are struggling in the wider community to work through issues that could divide us and where one person's words and actions can be hurtful and harmful to one another. James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, 
Do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly and spiritual devilish from where there is envy and selfish ambition. There will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it. So you commit murder and you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The gospel reading today is from Mark 9. It is interesting that the following passage makes the point that Jesus didn't want the public to know where he and the disciples were because it seems he wanted to un- he wanted uninterrupted time to teach the disciples about what it meant to follow him. There is a contrast between what Jesus is teaching and what headspace the the disciples were in. Jesus is talking about self-emptying and serving, and the disciples were concerned about how self-important they were. Mark 9. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples, and he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into human hands. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise again. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Charlene. Well, everybody, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a book that's been influential to me. And it, it actually sort of fits in with the scripture today because of James talking about being wise in community. And and Jesus, the passage where he talks about transcending ourselves and not just being full of ourselves. And it seems like that that's also uh, fits in with the, the message of today. Um, it's this book I want to talk to you about, How Good People Make Tough Choices, by somebody, I hope you can see this, by Rushworth Kidder. That's quite a name, <laughs> Rushworth. I haven't met him, met him Rushworth yet, but it's a, it's a very, um, it's just, it's an easy book to, but it's also a really helpful book to understand um, ethics. It's about how good people make tough choices. And so it's about um, ethical living. So just some simple points. And I, I want to invite you, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, if you can get that handy, because I want in a minute, I want you to write down uh, four things, and then I'm going to try and not have such a long message today so that we'll have a little bit of time together to share some examples of ethical dilemmas and, and, and the principles um, that are mentioned in this book. 
So uh, I hope you're grabbing, a little, if you have a handy, a little piece of paper and a, and a, and a pencil or pen. Um, but first, uh, something that I find it helpful that Rushworth Kidder says in his book is that an ethical dilemma is not a dilemma if it's between right and wrong. It's only a dilemma if it's between two rights or, or two virtues. But if it's, a, if it's a choice between, should I do the right thing or the wrong thing, that's not a dilemma. That's not an ethical dilemma. So what's an example of a wrong thing? Well, almost, almost always, if someone's going to steal or take something away from somebody, like you're going to shoplift, or you're just going to steal, even from the government, are you, you know, that kind of stuff, almost usually that's just wrong unless you're in a position like the man was in Les Mis, who was poor and he needed to steal some bread um, to, to live and for his family. And then you go, okay, that could be an ethical dilemma. But if someone just goes into Canadian Tire and should I steal this or not, that's not an ethical dilemma. Or if it's also, I'm going to hurt somebody, I'm gonna harm them. Should I do that or not? That's not an ethical dilemma. That's just, you just don't do that. An ethical dilemma is a dilemma because it's a choice between two right things, two virtues. And then Rushworth says in his book, all ethical dilemmas fall under four categories. Okay, and, and these are the categories I want you to write down. I'll talk about each one briefly. So the first one, and they, it doesn't really matter what order they come in, um, but the first one I talk about is it's on the, it's, it's between truth and loyalty. Actually, let me just tell you all four. You can write them all four down and then you can relax. So the first is truth versus loyalty. The second one is justice versus mercy. Okay, you got that? So truth versus loyalty, justice versus mercy. The third one is short-term versus long-term. Okay, so you got three down there. And the last one is individual versus community. So the first one is truth versus loyalty, then justice versus mercy, then short-term versus long-term. And then the last one is individual versus community. So that's all you need to write down, but you have those four categories or spectrums now in front of you. And let me just talk briefly about them. So the first one, truth versus loyalty, it's pretty easy to understand how important truth is. It's a little harder to uphold the value of loyalty, but loyalty is, is also a virtue, um, though, um, uh, and it just is. Um, so uh, for example, if you were in Nazi Germany and you were harboring a Jewish person in your house and the Nazis knocked on the door and said, are you harboring a Jewish person? And you said, I have to tell the truth because the truth is a virtue. You go, yeah, but loyalty is a virtue also. And I need to be loyal to this person. So I'm gonna say, no, I am not harboring a Jewish person in my house. That would be an ethical dilemma you would be in and you would choose probably, hopefully loyalty over truth in that case. Um, but loyalty comes up in other places. When I was a, in grade school, I was probably was in grade seven or eight. And uh, one morning before the teacher arrived, one of our classmates stuck a match, a wooden match stick in the, in the keyhole of the classroom door. So the teacher couldn't get her key into it. So then the principal was called and the principal lined all of us up along the wall of the hallway. And he was really giving us a lecture and um, almost threatening us to tell him who stuck the matchstick in the key. All of us knew who did it. None of it, like, but it was interesting how none of us kids tattled on our classmate. I guess because we had somehow in our DNA learned that loyalty, uh, you, you just don't, you just don't do that somehow. And so the principle was, was putting us in a situation of choosing truth over loyalty, and all of us chose loyalty over truth. So that's there. And I think that it shows up like when people say, 
uh, people in the police force uh, should not um, investigate a violation by a policeman because people will naturally be loyal to each other in, in a workplace, not just the police force. Um, we end up being loyal to each other in, in a school system or in a, in a business. Um, in the last few months, I heard someone say they, they brought a complaint to a manager about one of the employees and the manager said to this person, I am going to side with my employee because they're my employee. And uh, so that was loyalty in the workplace. Um, and, and so that has a virtue. We see it in political parties. Uh, there are people who will be loyal to their party. They will uh, overlook any kind of things that are imperfect in their own party, but they will see all the imperfections in another person's party. And so that's one of the spectrums of ethical, that ethical dilemmas fall under is truth versus loyalty. Okay, the second one is justice versus mercy. Both are virtuous, both are good. So if, if you have a child, like I remember our, one of our children at one point broke a window, um, I think either with a baseball or with a golf ball, and it was like, okay, um, you need to fix this window and you're gonna pay for it and you're gonna do the work and you're gonna fix the window. And it's not a big deal, we will forgive you because it's, there's like it both, if, if someone crashes into your car or crashes their car into your house, there's a good chance you're not gonna say, oh, don't worry about it, we'll just deal with it. There's a good chance you're gonna say, okay, uh, you need to make restitution, you need to fix this. Um, or your insurance company does, but uh, there's also mercy. And there's also mercy and forgiveness um, that are important as well. So if there's only justice and no mercy or only mercy and no justice, so justice and mercy are a category of ethical dilemmas. The third category is short-term versus long-term. And this, uh, an easy one for this is the, the economy versus the environment. So in the short term, we do what's good for the economy. People need jobs. They want, you know, they want um, uh, prosperity and, and so on. Uh, but in the long term, what's better for the planet and the environment? And so um, it's an ethical dilemma. Um, and it's also an ethical dilemma around things like in short term, long term, say, like Sally and I are gonna to fly tomorrow to Montreal to see our daughter for a little over a week. In the short term, we're going to have that experience. In the long term, we all need to travel less and, and protect our environment. And it's an ethical dilemma, how much we should consume how much, and, and how much we should, um, and how much we should not consume to protect our environment. And it, you know, the, the short term, long term could even be like, uh, Sally and I went golfing this week, and afterwards, I ended up having a really greasy Reuben with French fries, and I put sugar, sorry, just some technical things here. I put sugar in my coffee even. I had fat and sugar. In the short term, I thought my body needed it, and I'll deal with it. In the long term, I should not be eating like that very regularly. That's a bit of an ethical dilemma around even that kind of All right. All right. Well, I'm just going to... There we go. Now the last category is individual versus community. Both are virtuous, both are good, and they need to be seen and, and kept in balance. So an example for me here is when I coached uh, uh, grade school students, my job as a coach was to, to feel the tension of the ethical dilemma of what's best for each individual on that team because no one on that team joined to sit on the pine, as they say, all the time and watch other people play. I needed to give every individual as much court time as I could, as much individual attention as I could. But I also ha I had this dilemma because we also wanted to be as competitive and as successful as a team together. So um, I have met coaches, they, they just say to the kids, uh, do you wanna be competitive or not? The kids all say, yeah, we wanna be competitive. So they, the teacher just says, okay, I have no ethical dilemma. All we'll do is play the best kids to win all the time. And for me, that's an abdication of the ethical responsibility of the coach. They need to balance the individual um, good with the community good. 
And um, this is true in family life. Uh, every human being on the planet of the earth lives in this tension of individual versus community. Because in every family, a family exists to meet the needs of each individual. Each individual, for example, has a right of privacy. They have the right um, to get their needs met. Um, uh, needs are really important. Kids have to have their needs met, and so do adults. Um, and so we have individual needs that need to be met. And also to, to behave according to your age. So uh, each individual uh, has the right, like a, an eight-year-old has the right to be an eight-year-old. They don't have, they, they shouldn't be acting like a 40-year-old. And that's an individual right, and that's healthy. But in every family, you also have community needs. So every individual has to be contributing to the functioning of the family. Um, that is also virtue. Or uh, every individual has to say, how do my my words and my actions affect others, and I need to adjust myself. Because it's not right for me to act any way I want and, and adversely affect somebody else. So that is an example of individual versus community. So there's the four categories. And what Rushworth Kidder says is all ethical dilemmas fall under those four categories. So truth versus loyalty, justice versus mercy, short-term versus long-term, and individual versus community. Now, in a, just we have two or three minutes. I'd like to um, go off of this, like I'm, I'm gonna go back to the gallery view. I'd like to invite you to participate. If we can just think of an ethical, like what's an ethical dilemma that you face or that we as a society faces and I just want us to see if we can see how it falls into those four categories of truth versus loyalty, justice versus mercy, uh, short-term versus long-term, or individual versus community. So can anybody be so brave out there as to unmute yourself and suggest an ethical dilemma? Maybe it's something that you've recently been in yourself. I would like to enter first. To, and to me, it's a bit of an ethical dilemma but to interrupt, but just to remind people that this is being recorded. So if you were going to share something you wouldn't want to be recorded, you wouldn't share it. Thanks, Al. That's very important. That's like an ethical dilemma between individuals and community, I think. Yeah. Does anybody have an ethical dilemma that you've recently been in or you can think of that we could talk about? Yeah, um, you have to unmute yourself if you think of one. I think Kate's going to say something. So none of you have any ethical dilemmas. Um, well, I'll put one in. It's Helen here. Um, I'll just put the question out there. Are there too many motorized, not vehicles, boats <laughs> on Lake Windermere? Um, anybody thinking of one? Oh, I never heard Helen, no. Oh, you Helen, did. Helen Kipp, did you have one? Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Oh, yeah, I, I just know. ask if there are too many. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Thanks, Helen. Okay. Are there too many motorized boats on Lake Windermere? That's great, Helen. So, um, uh, Helen, let's work together on this. So, is there... I don't, I'm not sure that would fit under truth and loyalty. Uh, justice and mercy, um, but short-term, long-term, uh, that, that might fit under short-term, long-term. In the short-term, people wanna have a good time. And, um, but in the long-term, uh, and then the, the, maybe the big one is individual versus community because uh, people, are affecting others out on the lake uh, with their boats. And um, yeah, and if you have too many boats, it's, it, it becomes adverse to the lake and maybe to those living around the lake. 
So I can see, yeah, I can see that being an ethical dilemma. Thanks for that, Helen. Does anybody else have another one? Oh, there's yeah, the yeah, issue one. Brand, there's I, the, I, uh, well, go ahead, Charlene. I think there's the issue um, in our valley right now about short-term rentals. I think that's a dilemma between individuals who might need a short-term rental for a while. There's also the community um, concerns about that because they're, uh, the short-term rentals um, aren't always that respectful and um, um, take up take away from the, the, the rest of the hospitality and issue. That's a real dilemma right now in our valley, I believe. Thank you. That's a great example, Charlene, thank you. And Stan, did you have one? Yeah, I think the, well, what I've found, the thing that's tearing the people and groups right across this country is the, the ethical dilemma of being vaccinated or not being vaccinated. And it's just so prevalent now in a way that's never been before. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that, that really is why I thought I wanted to talk about this today. And I actually wrote, I needed to write an article for the Pioneer this week. So I wrote on this, individual versus community, hoping that the framework would be helpful for people to have. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and when I think about individual, because sometimes I struggle, well, what is an individual right? Uh, and I know that if our government said that, okay, we're going to go to war against some country, and all citizens, like, have to be conscripted and you have to fight. I, in that case, might be saying, I, I feel an individual um, tension. I, I feel an individual right. I want to maybe opt out of that war cry. Um, so uh, there is a place for individual rights in a community, but uh, certainly I think the vaccination situation or wearing masks, uh, I can see short term and long term there, but I certainly can see individual versus community. Yeah. Thanks, Dan, for that. And I have one, friend. Yes, yes Linda. <laughs> I don't know if I'm being taped, but I live on Vancouver Island, and the thing I am struggling with is protesters. I believe in peaceful protests. I don't believe in protests that break the law. And specifically, I really believe in preserving old growth forests, but it really bothers me what's happening here. Um, because I believe in peaceful and communication things to solve problems. So I wonder, Linda, thanks for that example. I wonder if there's like, you know, at the beginning, uh, I said that Rushworth Kidder said, it's not a dilemma if it's between right and wrong. So if somebody's doing something that's harming somebody, hurting them, like, then you start to go, uh, there might be a dilemma in how to protest. Maybe protesting is a virtue and there's a, but how we protest might become the dilemma. Yes. That's what I'm thinking, how we do it is my dilemma. Okay. I, I have one. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Wendy. Hi. So um, I think more along the lines of truth or loyalty, because one thing that I've struggled with <laughs> um, is, uh, and I'm thinking back to my college days when a classmate gave a speech and asked, how was it? And um, everybody everybody told them, oh, it was great, it was great. But in reality, it wasn't so great. And it was, it was really tough for me to decide, should I tell the truth as to how I really felt about that particular speech or presentation, or shall I just keep my mouth shut? So, and I've had that pop up a few times in life too, where someone asked me, well, what do you think? You know, what do you think of this? What, and they asked for the truth. And I've come to realize that people do not want to hear the truth unless it sheds them in a positive light. And that I've often struggled with. Great example, Wendy, thank you. And I'm sure all of us can relate to being in that situation. Um, I think I'll wrap up here, everybody, th but thanks for this. Um, back to the vaccination thing, I, I kind of just want to say is, um, Potentially, some people who are 
uh, they don't want to be vaccinated, potentially uh, need to realize that it's there. There is a community value that is part of the ethics. Is we don't just consider what's good for the individual; we consider what's good for the community. Though people in community also need to say, "Yeah, I mean, when is a line crossed when individual rights are are uh, disregarded?" And there is a line for all of us there too, um, and that is the dilemma, the tension that we live in when we do ethics well. And I, and I fit, again, it fits into uh, higher wisdom or um, being wise people on this planet, I think. So thanks for this, uh, everybody. And of course, um, uh, if you like the topic, you can get the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh. Our hymn uh, after the message is Bathe Me in Your Light. Bathe me in your light, O oh God of all, Creator. Let it shine upon my soul with healing and with grace. Be to me a beacon bright through shadows of life's wounding, showing me the way to live in faith in your embrace. Bathe me in your love, O oh source of awe and wonder. Help me Walk the sacred path of harmony and peace. May I be attentive to the musings of your presence, drinking from the well of hope that brings the heart relief. Bathe me in your grace, O oh one of spirit's longing. Teach me of your gentle ways that fill the soul with strength. Guide me on the pilgrimage that leads to truth and wholeness. Fill me with your promise of a love that knows no link. And good morning, Tess. Uh, thanks for leading us in prayers today. Good morning. Creator, nurturing God, we come to you with head bent in prayer. We offer our thanks for the rain that comes to refresh us and your creation, following a time of extreme heat and no moisture. May we rejoice in the bounty of the earth as we move from summer to autumn this week. We are moving into a time of harvesting the fruits of our labor and of your creation. We are living in a time of turmoil and uncertainty. On Monday, we exercise our right to vote and thus decide the future direction for us all for the foreseeable future. We have heard from candidates what they will do once in power. They have admonished us with what is wrong with the other candidate. We are being polled in all directions. May we heed the instructions given in the scripture readings of today. Show by our good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom, a wisdom that comes from your teachings. We are witnessing protests 
people pitting their desires and wants against others. There is disorder that has turned society upside down. May we feel your healing embrace and with grace, living in faith, be your beacon of light for us all. There are many among us who are feeling the pain in living. They may be unwell, grieving, lonely, suffering in silence, isolated from family and friends, unsure of how they are going to get to tomorrow. May our hands be your hands. May we open our hearts to all those in need. So as you love us, may we in turn with receiving and giving, extend that love to one and all. In our world, we celebrate a small boy separated from family who is now reunited with his father. We give thanks for these stories and others like it that are taking place around the world. There is still much going on in the world that goes against your teachings and the teachings of other faith groups. May leaders and peoples around the world feel your loving embrace. May we be your hands that help to raise all up to make this world a better place. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Beautiful words, um, Tess, beautiful prayer time. Thank you. Well, our last hymn is the Beatitudes, um, Blessed Are They. Blessed are they, the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they, full of sorrow, they shall be consoled. Rejoice and be glad, blessed are you, holy are you. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they, the lowly ones, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst, they shall have their fill. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are you, holy are you, and be glad yours is the kingdom of God blessed are they who show mercy mercy shall be theirs blessed are they the pure of heart they shall see God rejoice and be glad blessed are you Holy are you, rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they who seek peace, they are the children of God. Blessed are they who suffer in faith, the glory of God is theirs. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are you, holy are you. Rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who suffer hate all because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom shine for all to see. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are you, holy are you. Rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom of God. As we're reminded to be present 
at the beginning of our service. We need to be reminded to be present throughout our service and here at the end and as we leave our time together and go into our week ahead. To step out of our thoughts and time into the present and into the timeless is to step out of ourselves and be in this world in a new and different way. When we are present, we are no longer ourselves, really. We embody Christ consciousness. We transcend ourselves, and the light of God comes more clearly into the world through us. So continue to practice transcending yourself and being present in the world. Amen. stop recording at this time.